We turn now to our panel. Peggy Noonan is a Wall Street Journal columnist and CBS News contributor. Ron Fournier is the senior political columnist for National Journal. Robert Costa covers politics for The Washington Post. And also joining us is the new chief political correspondent for Slate Magazine, Jamel Bowie, and Mark Halperin, co-managing editor of Bloomberg Politics. Mark, you went on Mr. Trump's wild ride at the uh, Iowa State Fair. Let's take a listen. You think now you're clearly going to go through all the way to the end? Well, I'm number one in every single poll and by double digits in many cases. And we're having a good time and the people are agreeing with my message. And we're going to make America great again. So you're staying in to the end? I wouldn't even think about not. Do you get a free hat when you ride the, uh, the helicopter? That is extra. <laughs> what did you make of... Uh... Mr. Trump and the show out there in Iowa. He got a better reaction than Sarah Palin, Barack Obama, or George W. Bush at the fair. For what that's worth, people not just from Iowa, but from all over the country, partly a celebrity. But I walked with him for about 40 minutes through the fair. People shouted things to him that were some frivolous, but a lot of things like, save the country, stop Hillary Clinton, we need you. The establishment today, based on his performance at the fair, based on the latest polls, I think is simultaneously freaked out by Trump and still in denial about Trump. Peggy, let me ask you about what, there's Trump and then there is the Trump phenomena. Yes. So John Kasich suggested he is illuminating something important in the electorate. But yes. if you listen to the Wall, if you read the Wall Street Journal editorial page, they're saying what he's doing is tapping into some of the worst instincts of a portion of the electorate. Which is it? Well, I think the Wall Street Journal editorial page is a very great editorial page. But I think John Kasich had a deft political way of, of uh, approaching the Trump phenomenon, which is to say as a candidate, I understand this. I relate to this indignation and this desire for change. Carly Fiorina uh, approached it that way also. Look, in the Republican field, there's a little gingerness about how to treat Donald Trump. I think there is a general sense that Trump is going to be successful right up to the moment that in a way he determines he will not be successful. No one's going to take him down. He will take himself down if he goes down. Yeah, Ginger, because if you say something mean about him, he's coming back at well, you twice he as very, hard. Well, in the papers uh, in Maureen Dowd's column today, he actually made a warning. He said, you know, I don't hit first. I hit second. I hit hard. Yeah. Jamel, you wrote about anger this week. What's your sense of what Trump and, and also Bernie Sanders? I mean, voters are the ones who make this connection between the two of them. How do you see the, the electorate this time around? I think both Sanders and Trump are channeling voters who are angry at very specific sets of elites. On the left with Bernie Sanders, it's Wall Street. Uh, there's still a, a tremendous amount of anger among the left of the American public that Wall Street was never punished for what for the Great Recession, was never punished for the financial collapse, that, that even if the bailouts were a necessary solution, that the people who were responsible for, for tanking the economy kind of walked away scot-free. For Trump and the right, there is genuine frustration and anger at both the impotence of the of Republican elites over the past seven or eight years, even if, and I think, I think Republicans, um, the, the answer that, listen, we, we weren't in power, so we can't really, we can't do everything. Even if it's a totally legit answer, it still remains that uh, Republicans didn't do anything to stop immigration. They didn't do anything to stop up the Affordable Care Act. Sort of the signature accomplishments of the Obama administration, Republicans couldn't stop or even, really even slow down that much. Right. Okay, Jamal, we're going to come back. We'll talk more about Trump with all of you. We've got a lot more with our panel coming up. We'll be right back. Ron, I want to ask you about Donald Trump. He stayed at the top of the polls after the debate. People didn't know whether he'd finally gone too far. No, he's still at the top of the Republican polls. But his challenge has always been the number of Republicans who say they will never vote for him. He's the highest in that poll number. And in general election matchups, he loses to Bernie Sanders, Hillary Clinton, Joe Biden. Has he done anything or shown any signs of doing anything that solved that problem for him? We could talk endlessly about what he's done politically. I think as a issue-wise, um, personality-wise, temperament-wise, he's not done a thing that suggests to me that he should be anywhere near the Oval Office. But, you know, this isn't about Donald Trump. This is about an angry America, a very anxious America that has been let down by the political system, that knows nobody's paying attention to him, that no politicians only care about winning, don't care about them. And it's an it's a electorate that is part of a big social change with this little thing called the internet, where they're, they're now used to major disruption institutions. They now know they have the power to bring down 
the media and change our business, to, to change the retail industry, to change the banking industry. They've seen great change in society, and they want it in politics. So if Trump flames out tomorrow, or if he flames out after two terms, God help us, uh, this, this, what he represents, what he re reflects, this anger and anxiety, um, this demand for disruption, is not going to go away until somebody uh, real, incredible, and, and, and positive and forward-looking changes politics. That's the only way we're going to stop this Trump phenomenon, because that's what the phenomenon is. It's not about Trump. It's Robert, about this country. Robert, uh, the next challenge for Trump is turning the circus that he's, he's created into an organization. I mean, he's going to have to create an organization. What's your sense of that part of campaigning for him? On Friday, I spoke with Trump and his campaign manager, Corey Lewandowski, and I said, what does this moment mean for the Trump campaign? And their answer was, it's a time of transition, that Trump needs to keep up the energy he has established with the Republican base this summer. At the same time, they need to build more of an infrastructure in Iowa, New Hampshire, and South mm -hmm. Carolina, and also unveil policy plans. Trump came out with an immigration paper today. He expects in early September in the next few weeks to come out with one on taxes. He's talking to different people at think tanks. He doesn't want to lose the edge he has, but he's hired Rick Santorum's guy, for example, in Iowa to help a have a ground game. They have this big blue bus with Trump and make America great again across the sides. It goes to all these Walmart parking lots and signs people up without even having the candidate there. The celebrity draws people in. Now it's a question of how do you keep them with Trump? And to your Sh point and to, and to Mark's point, the establishment is kidding themselves if they think they can stop this guy. The establishment is weak now. The parties are, are weak. If the people really decide that this is the, the vessel for their change, uh, watch out. You know, Trump could go a long way. There's two universes now. There's the establishment universe where you, anybody asking the establishment says, Bush, Walker, Rubio, maybe Kasich can be the nominee. That's it. Then there's the universe of grassroots activists and voters that put Trump, Carson, Cruz increasingly, Fiorina to some extent, four outsiders, uh, four anti-establishment candidates towards the top. And I think right now, Trump's ability to convert the energy, you know, you, you do an event with 2,000 people, as Carson did, as Trump has done more, and you get names and email addresses and you bring new people into the process. That's what Obama did, President Obama did in Iowa. They have the capacity to change the Republican electorate. The establishment doesn't understand that. And they're on I top of the I, polls I in Iowa right now, aren't yeah. they? I, I don't think and that's, nationally. I don't think that's the capacity to change the Republican electorate. Because when you look at the kinds of people that Trump is appealing to, that Cruz and uh, Carson are appealing to, this is sort of a, a this is the, the white working class. This is the white sort of what we call the lower middle class. These are people who justifiably feel economically anxious, feel kind of shut off from major institutions. But they are not. Um, uh, a, a new part of the Republican electorate. Well, they are because not, some of them don't vote. Yeah, some Trump of them, vote. The, some Trump, of them don't. the Trump people in Iowa are doing events and bringing in people who say, what's a caucus? You know, wh what do I do to, if I want to support Donald Trump? The establishment has always won. Every election since Reagan, the establishment has won. Perhaps that natural order will be restored, but it's not general, right now. But 20 years ago, they would identify as a Democrat. Yeah. Five, for the last five years, 10 years, they've identified as Republican, but, but many now, of them have not voted. Now they're a declining percentage of the electorate. And let's not say- Not a Republican nominating fight. They are but, in a general but election. It, but as far, as far as a general election is concerned, let's say that Trump mobilizes these people and they come out. That still does not actually guarantee any sort of Republican victory in 2016 whatsoever. Yeah, no exactly. guarantee at all. It in, it in fact may alienate moderate white and middle class whites who may be afraid of this kind of general phenomenon. Let me ask Could you, I but, note, Jamal, also that it's a lot of middle class people also who are for Trump, not only working class. He's, he's got some pull in the, the great American middle there. Robert, what do you think about what Lindsey Graham tried to do today? This is, you know, effort number 47 to try to take down Trump. And his argument basically was he's for self-deportation. Remember how that, Republicans say, hurt Mitt Romney last time around. So danger if the person at the top of the polls believes in this. Do you think that's a credible argument? It, it is a credible argument. A lot of the Republican leadership believes if you don't move more to the center in immigration, as everyone's saying, you could lose some voters in the general election. But Trump's not backing down from this immigration position. In fact, the one U.S. senator he called to counsel him on this new immigration plan, Jeff Sessions from Alabama, who's the, the favorite of the hard right. So Trump's sending a signal to the base, I'm still with you on immigration. I'm coming out some policy papers because everyone's demanding meat on the bones, but I'm still with you. Let's talk mm -hmm. policy. Well, all Trump has said about immigration so far is that he wants to kick everybody else and let the good ones back in on an expedited basis. You know what that is? That's gold-plated amnesty. That's very expensive amnesty. The base doesn't understand it yet. They eventually will. Peggy, what did you make of John Kasich? If we can switch from yeah. Trump to our, uh, to, to our guest today, he's kind of a happy warrior out there bouncing around the campaign trail. He is. He is. The happy warrior is a, is a phrase that Franklin Roosevelt used 
on Al Smith trying to capture some of his magic on the trail. I think Kasich is, is looking good in New Hampshire. I interviewed him this week. He was, of course, very bullish. But he made a big point that he made uh, partly today. He said, my background is so conservative in terms of spending and taxing and trying to balance budgets and turning around Ohio's credit rating. That's all conservative. He said, but he said to me, you well know, this is a man who has a real heart for certain issues that vibrate among Americans. One is what to do with the young mentally ill. The other is what to do about those addicted to drugs. He has an unembarrassed heart in his approach to those questions. And I think it's going to have some power. The establishment wing of the party is going to have to settle on one or two people by March 1st. And I think today, if you look at, again, the four people the establishment talk about, leave Governor Christie aside, Kasich, Bush, Walker, Rubio, the one who right now is a rising stock, the one who has got the least obvious blemishes in terms of uh, momentum is Kasich, but no one's gone after him yet. I'll, I'll yeah. Even Trump True. hasn't gone after I'll him I'll add yet. to that. True. I think there's a sweet spot for a Republican presidential candidate. And it's basically, uh, I want to cut your taxes. I don't want to stick it to anyone. And I think Kasich hits that perfectly. He, yeah. wants, he wants to be responsible. He wants to give your money back. He also wants to make sure low-income people can get health care. He wants to make sure pe the mentally ill can get care. He wants to make sure people in prison can get out and get back to their lives. And that's a combination that is very potent. It's George W. Bush's combination. It's to an extent Ronald Reagan's combination. It's the kind of uh, approach that really does appeal to a wide section of Americans and people who may not even think of voting for Republicans in the first place. I find him to be right now the most Reagan-esque of the candidates. He's aspirational. He's electable, and he's ideological, but pragmatic. But I really want to see what happens when Mike Murphy and the, and the Bush pack unloads on yeah. him on, on yeah. Obamacare in yeah. And not to Mike. take anything away from, from what Ron said about him and others have said, he's the media's favorite candidate. And that is a dirty little secret that it is a big benefit. George Bush was the media's favorite candidate in 2000. McCain was for a time. When you're the media's favorite candidate, you do well. And any Republican you think so who? Then? You think? Oh, yeah. Uh, Robert, Does me... Kasich have money? Yeah. Yes. He, yeah. How's he his did, fundraising uh, yeah. going? No, he has a. He's still doing okay with his normal fundraising, but like every candidate these days, pretty su substantial when it comes to a super PAC. Robert, who else? If if Kasich is on the rise, who is on the fall, or or who has been blotted out by the the change in the landscape since the debate? Well, the hardest thing right now in the Republican field of 17 is if you're on the right side of the party. If you're Ted Cruz, Mike Huckabee, even Ben Carson, who's still an outsider and popular, the Trump phenomenon has, has taken all that political oxygen out of the room. And I think you see a lot of them trying to cozy up to Trump, come to Trump voters, hope they eventually fall their way. But still, it's impossible to get attention if you're not, if you don't have the swagger of Trump, if you don't have that, that humanity of Trump that just comes through in this unbridled enthusiasm he has in every event. Don't, under, I'm sorry, don't underestimate Cruz's money. Cruz is raising a big super PAC money. And don't underestimate his early state and long-term strategy. Okay. Very few of the candidates are thinking about both the first four states and down the road. And real quick, Cruz something is. on Cruz, you're so right. Know what the Cruz people think is their moment? This p potential government shutdown this fall. Remember, that was Cruz. That's how he became a national star in 2013. If the Republicans in the House try to shut down the government over Planned Parenthood and Cruz leads that fight, they think they can see a resurgence. Yep. All right. Well, we're going to be back in a minute. We'll talk about some Democrats. Stay with us all. We'll be back in a moment. We're back with more of our discussion. Before we move on to the Democratic race, there's a lot going on there. Peggy, I wanted to ask you one question, which is Jeb Bush gave a speech about Iraq this week. He took on Hillary Clinton, said the troubles there were partially her fault. But why did he? Why does he give a speech about Iraq, given that his brother is so associated with that? It was a mystery to me. It was uh, at the Reagan Library, in a way, relitigating reliter Iraq is not really where he should be because of his brother. But it's also not where the American people are. When they're thinking about foreign policy, they're very consumed with the idea of what next? What do we do about ISIS? All those future things. Relitigating seemed a strange thing. There are a number of candidates who are stuck in a kind of a tar paper or bug paper. Jeb is stuck on the bush thing. It's hard for him to get yeah, away really from it. It's surprising. No, actually, I think it'd be, it'd be easy because his, his, his father is held in great esteem. Even yes. his brother is held in better esteem. With and who better, who better to talk about the mistakes we made in Iraq and what yeah. we can learn from them than a guy named Bush? Instead, what do we have? We have somebody yesterday who said, the war never should have happened. 
Once it did happen, you should have left the troops in. It's really double fault. Who said that truth yesterday? Trump. Donald Trump. When Donald Trump is speaking common sense, more so than the, Jeb, Jeb, the other Jeb candidates, Bush, we got a big problem. Jeb Bush, He's to win, stuck. feels he must be the national security candidate. He's going to do some veterans events this week. They feel like he needs to be a conservative governor of Florida. That record, the super PAC is going to advertise on that. But he needs to be the president on the stage, the only potential commander in chief. The only way to talk about national security is to talk about what's gone on recently. And as he points out, the last two Republican presidents are his relations, so he can't avoid talking about their legacy, even if he does it somewhat uncomfortably at times. All right, let's switch now to the Democrats if we can. Jamel, I want to ask you about Hillary Clinton's email issues. She turned over her server. That was unexpected. Yeah. She said she wasn't going to do that. And she seems to have kind of a three-pronged approach. One is make light of it. She made that Snapchat a joke. Uh, the other is to say this is a part of totally partisanship, total partisan witch hunt. And the other is to get involved in some fights. She's right. taken on Jeb Bush. She took on Marco Rubio. What's your sense of that three-pronged strategy? I think it will probably work to avoid any damage to her in the Democratic primary and assuming she's the nominee in sort of a general election. I myself have a very hard time, especially when, when the campaigns kick in and, and everyone and partisans can remember that they're Democrats and Republicans. I have a hard time imagining that there's going to be anyone who walks into a voting booth and says, you know, I love Hillary Clinton's education plan, but uh, those emails, so I guess I'm going to vote for Marco Rubio now. Um, I, that's, that's just not going to happen. What, what I do think is her fundamental problem with the emails is the extent to which they emphasize the worst parts of, um, I think, what people believe about her. Uh, people believe that she's too secretive, um, that she's evasive. People believe um, that she might be hiding something or that she's not being honest. And even if there's nothing there in this email uh, saga, I think that when it comes to getting to the momentum it would take to actually uh, compete strongly in a general election, it, it kind of, it holds her back. I don't think it prevents her because I, I just don't think that's how campaigns work, but I think it holds her back a bit. Ron, you've covered the Clinton since the mid 80s. What's your take on? Well, I, w I don't disagree with anything you're saying, but it's not the only issue. Covering politics isn't just about who's winning and losing and who's going to win or lose. There's some bigger issues involved in it. Look, I'm a swing voter, an independent voter. I've known and respected her for a long time. Um, a year ago, if you'd asked me, hey, would you consider working for Secretary Clinton? I'd say, yeah, I'd think about it. Six months ago, if you'd said, hey, would you vote for her? I'd say, yeah, I'm likely going to vote for her. Now I can't tell you that I trust her because there's some big issues involved. I can't tell you that I trust her with the Freedom of Information Act and our public records. I can't tell you I trust her with Congress's right and responsibility to conduct oversight. I can't tell you I respect her with historians' right and responsibility to look back on archival document to see how our leaders lead. If this precedent that she has established is allowed to stand because she won, the public memory is, it will be under assault forever. There will no longer be a public memory if everyone conducts themselves the way she has. And I haven't even talked about classified documents. I also wonder about, when it, every time we have a scandal like this, how does it reflect on the kind of leader the person would be? You write a lot about this, John. What, what does it say about the kind of leader they'd be? Well, is this someone who we can really trust to be transparent and accountable? Is this someone whose judgment we can count on? Is this somebody whose integrity we can count on? I don't know if I can trust Hillary Clinton anymore, and it doesn't make me happy to say that. They're, deal they're dealing with this issue with spin and misdirection rather than authenticity and honesty and openness, which is what the public would like, I think, in, in, with everyone. And the FBI and the Justice Department, based on what's been reported about what they're doing, seem to be doing a security investigation that could draw in her aides, could have potentially draw in her. And as long as their posture towards it is to deny and to spin, I think she's setting herself for this to be a very long-running problem. And Jamal, you're yeah. right. I'm not going to go in the voting booth and say I'm going to vote against her because of the emails, but I'm going to say, okay, I agree with her on climate change, for example, but is she really going to get it done? Can I trust her? I have to be able to trust somebody to, to have them leave my country. Robert, do you think that this is a quite, this we've now heard about Joe Biden possibly running for president? Now, the difficulties for Hillary Clinton have coincided with the time in which Joe Biden said he was going to make up his final mind. So we have a conflation here a little bit. But uh, is there a path for Joe Biden? There may be a path, but when you talk to Democrats who are friendly with Biden, friendly with Al Gore, they sense that her campaign is weakening. At the same time, you still have to beat her, and she has a formidable operation, and you have to really compete with an historic candidate, someone who has deep roots in the Democratic Party. So it's fun to think and strategize on the sidelines, but once you get in, how much, how hard are you really going to hit her? You see Governor O'Malley, he doesn't really want to go hard after yeah. Secretary Clinton. Same with Senator Sanders. Even her yeah. aides say she's going to lose some contests, right? Even they say that. So when she loses, when she's cut, 
if I may go to a sports metaphor, does she bleed? Does she fight back? And who's in the ring to fight back against her? If Bernie Sanders beats her in a primary caucus, can she fight back against that? More likely than if someone like a Joe Biden or an Al Gore is there, I think. I mean, I think the, most, the most ahead. important bit of information about sort of Hillary Clinton's electoral uh, status is just the sheer number of endorsements she has from the Democratic Party uh, lawmakers. She has more endorsements as a primary candidate than any primary candidate in the Democratic Party has had since like the 70s. Um, so I, 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 do, I cannot imagine a scenario in which even losing a state like Iowa or New Hampshire would actually damage your chances because that would essentially require the bulk of the Democratic Party to say, I, I guess we got to find someone else, and that just seems unrealistic to me. I can't imagine Sorry. a scenario in which nobody comes forward on the Democratic side to challenge Mrs. Clinton. She's in the middle of a difficult time. The difficult time over the emails isn't going to end for a while because the Department of Justice, the FBI, the courts. So this is going to go on. Her numbers are going down a little bit. She's still strong in Iowa, but she's getting hurt in New Hampshire. I don't understand a Democratic Party in which somebody doesn't look at this, say, that is a bruised candidate. I am going in there. I, I think, just don't I th understand it. The Republicans got too many. They got 17. <laughs> I, I think but they also the, the, don't have anybody who can step in and say, shake it all. You know, make it make sense. They got sense. 17 people trying to shake <laughs> it all no, up. I, mean, I don't understand do the I Democrats. Think she, I think she wins a nomination after losing a state or two. I think a uh, better chance than that she becomes president because of the structural issues politically. And I wonder why more people in the media, more people in the Democratic Party who are who are leaking stuff anonymously, why they don't have the spine yeah. to say, is this just about winning yeah. Hillary Clinton? Is that all this is about, is winning, or are you going to win the right way? I mean, frankly, yeah. I think they would say it's just about winning. It is very unusual for a party to hold the White House for three consecutive terms. But frankly, terms. politics is supposed to be better than that, right? Yeah. I mean, don't, don't underestimate, this, though. I mean, look, I agree with you about the emails and, and the, the, the importance of it as a, a policy issue. Don't underestimate how good she's been for the last couple of weeks. You, you talked about the list of things she does. When she's gone after the Republicans, when she's aggressively taken engaged with the Republicans who are likely to be the nominees, she's been very strong. And she's been doing a lot of policy speeches as well, yeah. Robert. Let's not forget about Bernie Sanders here. I mean, he's up in a poll in New Hampshire. He's ahead. He's doing better in the national polls. Explain to people where what his chances are uh, for the long term here, uh, despite the, the real energy he certainly has at the moment. Well, you see him going to all, almost all 50 states. He's not just going to the early primary states. He's going to liberal hotbeds around the country, looking ahead to a long fight. But he really believes the grassroots network he's established in Iowa, being the neighboring state, the neighboring senator from Vermont in New Hampshire, provides him with strength. And if he can get a boost out of those first two contexts, even with Clinton's network and campaign, he can get a launch to a real fight, long drawn out nomination. You want to know why Donald Trump's doing so well? It's because we have conversations like this where all we talk about is whether or not she's going to win. And you're right that the parties only care about winning. That's why a feckless blowhard like Donald Trump right now is a top of polls. <laughs> okay, we're going to have to end it on feckless <laughs> blowhard. Not what I would have That's guessed. That's not my line, actually. It's we'll be back with a look the at the history made this week in Cuba.